Is my slide yes, visible? Sir. Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you. So see, I'm talking about classroom communication skills for the next couple of hours. It doesn't mean that uh, I'll be uh, talking uh, only about what happens inside the, the classroom. I will also be uh, talking something about what happens in the, in the, in the campus. And I'll be uh, touching upon the whole repertoire of strategies and techniques we employ when we communicate with our uh, students. But for convenience sake, uh, we have titled it as Classroom Communication uh, Skills. As I said, uh, I have set apart one significant chunk of my, of my time to talk about skills, communication skills for online teaching, because that is the, the crisis we are passing through, and most of us are still struggling to come to terms with. Most of us are uh, still fighting with different aspects of linking to the student community on the other side uh, of, the, of the communication divide, right? And I know that there would be a lot of comments, a lot of concerns towards the end of my session regarding the difficulties we face, the challenges we come across when we try to communicate with students uh, online. But let us, let us be very sure about it, very clear about it. COVID is, is not an option for any one of us. We didn't ask for it. This is a crisis which been forced upon us. And we need to uh, overcome the crisis in one way or another, which is exactly why we are thrown into the difficult waters of uh, online communication. I'm sure we, we, we understand uh, the struggles are not of our making, but for reasons beyond us. Now, what are the challenges of online teaching we are, we are facing today? Number one, uh, you know that it's, it's isolation. Uh, I am actually right now positioned at Al Shifa College, which is in Perindalmanna, Malapuram, Kerala. And all the participants of this uh, program run by UGC, HRDC, Kannur University are, are, are scattered in different parts of the country. So when I try to communicate with you, I always have this the kind of a nagging concern, nagging worry, kind of doubt at the back of my mind regarding whether I am able to connect with you uh, properly. How can I make my feel, make you feel my presence uh, without making you feel isolated? How do I connect with you? So social isolation has thrown people out of the classrooms and in the bargain it has given us a lot of challenges in terms of connection. And the second element is the emotional stress resulting from it. We all know that for communication to be smooth, a state of mind, the context in which we communicate, the emotional attitude of yours, uh, how, far, how far are you ready to listen to someone when someone is speaking to you? Uh, these things are generally quite relevant. So when we try to communicate to someone who is under stress, how do we do that? Everyone is going through a stressed uh, period now. With masks on, a frequent washing of your hands, the smell of Dettol in the air kind of thing, it's very difficult for all of us. You cannot touch people, which is very important in, in communication. You cannot hug, you cannot sit together, huddle together in a group. All these things become uh, very challenging and very, very difficult. So the stress is another element which upsets the paradigms of uh, communication uh, in, in, in many ways. Third is the digital competence. 
uh, when we have to communicate with people far around, students who are in different parts of the land, uh, we use technology and most of us teachers are not well trained in technology. We are not experts in it. And even when the UGC, central government, state government, higher education council, maybe your college management, IQAZ, when all these bodies have been telling you to get trained, to use more online tools, to be more competent, uh, most of us may not have taken it very seriously. And now uh, the pandemic has arrived and most of us are probably caught in a technological handicap. We do not have the kind of competence required to, to make us perform well using digital platforms. Which is why the last six months have been, probably for the, if you take the last hundred years, the last six months have been six months of incredible professional development in terms of teaching skills and teacher competence. We are forced to, and we are trying to do justice to it. And the fourth element is exposure element. Earlier, when I taught a class, only my class would be listening to me. My students would be listening uh, to me. Now, when you record a session and send it to students, well, you do not know how far it would go. It can reach far and wide, right? And some of us are really concerned about who would be watching and who all would be listening to my, my classes, my recorded uh, sessions. Exposure brings in concern. And related, as I mentioned earlier, is the quality of the audio and the video which we produce. The video data, the audio data, which we record on our instruments, maybe in our media rooms and all, and when we send it around, the quality of the audio and video becomes very important. And sometimes we have a concern. Like when, when people watch my video, when people listen to my uh, audio, what will, what will they think about uh, my recording? Will they be happy about it? Aren't there better recordings and better presentations by other faculties from other colleges and other universities? Isn't that a possibility? Isn't it a truth? So all these elements are mixed together uh, here. And we are struggling to address a lot of challenges thrown to us by uh, online uh, teaching during the pandemic caused uh, crisis. How can we address this and how can we try to solve these issues by fine-tuning our communicative uh, competence? This is one of the fundamental uh, questions we uh, have to handle these days. This is exactly what upon some of this. I don't think that these are, these are merely your concerns. These are partially my concerns uh, uh, too. Uh, I'm trying to uh, do my session sometimes standing up in the media room so that when I stand up, you know, it gives me more energy. It gives me a better feel of uh, uh, handling a real uh, classroom. Okay. There's something called a transactional distance, a term I have borrowed uh, from education uh, terminology. Uh, it talks about issues related to the distance uh, between the teacher and the student. When the learner and the instructor are, are separated by time and space, when you're learning sometimes becomes asynchronous, there could be difficulties uh, created out of that, difficulties born out of that. And part of the difficulties we are facing today are related to this distance, as I said, transactional 
uh, distance and it would be it would be nice always if if you can read up more about uh, this uh, element now coming back specifically to my concern our concern uh, today when we try to communicate with our learners in an online environment there are two types of communication we talk about communicating lessons per se and communicating about lessons i mention these separately because uh, often we neglect one part of it we neglect communicating about lessons and we give more importance to communicating our uh, lessons to lessons and that would be a lopsided emphasis because when you emphasize only the lessons and you do not emphasize communicating about the lessons a kind of meta meta communication about those lessons especially when your learners are separated uh, from you it can uh, create uh, difficulties in actual uh, classroom kind of a context you know that uh, we don't give a lot of importance to the soft skill part of it the functional language part of it we often try to give stress to the lecture part of it you come to the classroom and lecture for some 30 40 minutes and go what is often more important is the way you communicate and build relationship with your learners in the middle of your lecture when you go for a small talk but we occasionally marginalize that so communicating about lessons uh, you have to build channels of communication with your uh, learners you have to talk about the time of your lessons the mode of your lessons the means of communication uh is it social media is it whatsapp or are you going to just text to them or will you mail to them or are you going to uh, access it through skype or uh, some other uh, channels is it telegram whatever so you need to have a protocol established regarding which which mode you will be using which app probably you will be using which tool will be used with which you will be connecting with them and this information becomes very significant especially when the the learner and the instructor the student and the teacher are separated by uh, distance you are a stressed out community and the learners are also stressed out so it's quite important uh, that you try to make the mode of communication the means as smooth and as convenient as comfortable as uh, possible now as i said when you talk about the challenges thrown in by uh, uh online communication we may have issues related to as i said distance visibility data sharing and emotional isolation how do we address uh, these concerns i'll take the first one the first one is related to distance see if you talk to someone uh, far away from you talk to people uh, using a phone or some other uh, medium to connect to someone far away you try to bond with them and when you try to bond with them when you try to build uh, an emotional relationship because bonding is more about uh, connecting through emotional ch- channels it's not simply uh, intellectual kind of an exercise in which you give them lesson they get the lesson you check whether they got it whether they understood finished that is more business like that's more of a ritual which loses its significance in the short run not even in the long run so when distance becomes a problem you should try to be more 
informal in your channels of communication. Try to bond with them and try uh, to use more uh, interactional language over there. Your traditional good morning or good afternoon uh, may not be sufficient in that kind of a uh, situation. You will have to use more uh, functional language to check about their well-being, to check their emotional uh, state of mind, to check uh, uh, about sometimes about the family members, to check about the context in which they are sitting, some comments about uh, where they are. These things are very important. And some of the recent articles regarding online communication and ongoing research about online communication clearly state that, for example, if you ask your students to turn on the camera and when they become visible to you and you become visible uh, to them, there's a better relationship built in the process. I know that that would create bandwidth issues, uh, data issues and all that. Uh, and sometimes connectivity will be strained a little bit if everyone is turning on the camera. True. But if occasionally you can ask your students to, uh, to be visible over there, uh, retention of what they have learned and connection with them uh, increases, as the study says. So try to find time, if not during the group class time, try to find uh, time during which you'll be able to chat up with them, you, you'll be able to see them, they will be able to see you, and communication channels would be stronger. They would be uh, emotionally in a better state of mind to connect to your lessons. That's why I spoke about uh, invisible and visible kind of a transformation. You need to uh, increase your visibility in a number of ways. And increasing visibility on the screen need not necessarily be always by turning on the camera. It can be visibility through the language you use. For example, when you address your uh, students by name, they kind of become uh, visible. So every instance you get to address them, calling them by their name should be made uh, use of. Occasional comments, attempts to chat up with them uh, in the middle regarding one point or other would be always uh, very relevant. Remember, whenever you're online, Please do not stick to the traditional habit of lecturing uh, for 30 minutes. Even I'm doing it for two hours now. Apologies. Uh, you, you will have to break it into small chunks of information. And uh, it should be something like 10, 15 minutes duration. Then you can have a chat up with them. Then come back to the material you try to uh, present. So visibility can be increased through some, uh, the chatting opportunities you create, uh, the, the opportunities for, for uh, conversation which you build into your presentation. And the third one regarding data sharing, I talk about it again. You record your session and send it to different students in different parts of the country. And now, the data you record and you share with them, please make sure that the, the data you record and share uh, will be of good quality so that people who listen to it and people who watch it should be uh, convinced of the quality of the stuff you have sent and, and distributed to different parts. This is quite important. It takes a lot of time uh, too. This is why uh, the workload on the teaching community has uh, kind of tripled. Because according to one estimate, if, uh, if you shoot a class of 50, 50 minutes, let us say, you would require three times that time, 
hundred and hundred and fifty minutes you would require to edit that stuff and make it ready to be sent or shared sent to the student, shared with the uh, student or academic community. It's a time-consuming uh, uh, exercise, definitely. And some of us may not be competent enough technologically to take it up to. But anyway, make sure that your data is good, right? Make it doubly sure. Otherwise, uh, it might reflect back uh, on us. This is a problem. And the last element I'm speaking about, that emotional isolation, that's just like the distance we have mentioned earlier. You need to bond to with them. This is why I said uh, it's very difficult for us to keep on watching the screen for a long time, I realize. We are all struggling. Students too will be struggling uh, a lot. We struggle when we prepare. They struggle uh, when they listen to what we have prepared. So uh, they, they are not able to get out of their place. Campus is more about the social experience, you know that. And when they are cut off from the campus, when the young are cut off from the campus, dynamic, energetic kind of people, when they are cut off from the campus, it's like denying their lifeline, a serious lifeline of theirs. So they, they really struggle. So the words you use, expressions you use, the body language you employ, should be soothing uh, to uh, them, okay? Now, being online, when you, when you talk about online community, if you're part of a WhatsApp group, for example, that's a kind of online community. Facebook is a kind of an online community. So we are actually members of lots of online communities. And when students take to an app or a particular media for learning, they too become members of an online community. So don't think that online communities are without its pleasures and delights and fun and entertainment, no. Then you will say that uh, WhatsApp is used for a different purpose and classroom is, is, is meant for an absolutely uh, much different kind of a purpose. So what happens in a, in a social media community, we cannot make it happen. We shouldn't let it happen uh, in an educational community. Absolutely, I agree. But there are certain elements you have to, you have to borrow uh, from uh, an online uh, community uh, experience, which will be uh, employable in the online uh, teaching uh, too. The kind of smileys you use, the, the emoticon you employ, certain gestures you use, certain images you use, um, certain practices of sharing happiness you employ online. That, I'm sure many of you are doing it, that also should be brought to the online uh, level. It becomes quite, uh, quite uh, significant in that way. Now, a very, very uh, disturbing element as far as online teaching is concerned is the, the case of the missing body, I would say. <laughs> the other day, uh, after I have done an online webinar presentation, uh, one colleague of mine sent me a screenshot and she reminded me that, sir, this is a webinar and you should be very aware of the size of the screen. Because I used to be a person, uh, I'm still a person, who would love to move around a little bit, use my hands and all uh, to, to uh, extract every inch of communicative mileage out of my hands face uh, kind of thing. The screenshot she has sent to me has caught me in such a posture that I've been throwing my hands around and uh, part of which is completely cut. She said you have to limit yourself. You have to box yourself in within that uh, frame. This is a very painful part of the communication uh, process. 
I'm sure that many of you have become experts by now, and many of you have started uh, uh, using the, the frame effectively so that you will be restricting yourself to a part of it, leaving room enough to throw away your hands uh, and all. But the moment you are cut off from people, you know, the first thing is the physical proximity is taken away, which is very disturbing. And we will have to find ways in which you can uh, not reasonably, but in a, in a limited sense, how we can compensate uh, for that. Communication theory tells you very, very, very evidently that it's around uh, 30 plus percentage, if you exaggerate 40, but it's less than 40, some say 37. So much significance we, we normally employ to the language part of the communication, whereas around 60 plus, 70 if you exaggerate, okay, is for physical communication. It's for body language. And because we don't have big shooting studios, media rooms with uh, state-of-the-art technology, state-of-the-art technology is a term we use in the NAC and IQSU report. In fact, we may not have such facilities, top flight facilities available in the campus. When you, sh when you shoot yourself with that, when you shoot yourself with the, with the camera of your mobile phone, much of what you say will be cut off, right? Your facial expressions sometimes will be blurred and there will be no movement at all. When these things are taken away, a good share of the engaging part of the communication process is uh, taken away. And you will have to balance it through what I said earlier, the interactional language you use. Having more short questions with them, uh, try to chatting up with one-line dialogues with them, seeking a response from them. That becomes one of the ways in which you can attempt to compensate. You can't really do that. Attempt to uh, uh, compensate for the, the case of the missing body. The, the case of the missing uh, body language uh, part. And it remains to see in how far we will be successful in, in uh, doing it. Because when hands, movement, and face are taken out of the communication equation, you will have to be very talented and, and you should have lots of expertise in the rest of it to drive home your lessons through uh, digital uh, media. We know the difficulty, but let's see how we can rise to the occasion, rise to the crisis. One significant uh, uh, lesson we need to learn when we teach online, when we communicate online, is regarding the patience we should exhibit. Everyone should be patient in a, in a, in a crisis situation, but often, uh, funnily, most of us lose our cool when we have a crisis situation. Emotions run very high, right? And we, we will be struggling to control our emotions, struggling to control uh, ourselves. So students are upset because they cannot come to the, to the campus. Uh, students are uh, upset because they are not able to uh, <coughs> communicate well with their family members and uh, other, other members. And add to that, you, we are all upset too. So the student uneasiness, teacher uneasiness, uneasiness in the community around us creates problems. We need to be patient to navigate this uh, crisis. And when you have the institutional demands 
or like you do this, you do that. Sometimes because of the directions you, they get from the higher bodies, like, like for example, UGC will tell you that you can open your colleges, uh, you can open the mess and all, you can open hostels, but you should remain social distance. Funny preposition. Not practical at all. So institution might might force uh, certain try to force certain practices which are irrational, which doesn't make much of a sense. So everyone is in a in a in a, a difficult state of mind. Be patient, and the patience should be reflected in the language you use. Patience should be reflected in your body language. Patience should be reflected on your, on your face. It should be reflected in your attitude toward your learning community. Because work from home, learn from home, or FH, you know, FH is a very uh, popular combination now. Work from home, learn from home, teach from home kind of thing. Uh, WFH, LFH kind of thing. It creates uh, lots of stress because many of us are not used to consider home as a base station from where we work. So the language you use should be patient. It should be reflected in the tone with which you speak. It should be reflected in the, the words you choose to communicate uh, yourself. Uh, this is not easy often because uh, I do not know how many of us uh, respect our learners and, and treat them as equals to us and try to communicate in that kind of a uh, language. If we do not have a practice of uh, doing it that way, uh, the pandemic is definitely giving us a, a, a time to transform ourselves into uh, that kind of a, of a teacher. So be patient and let your communication uh, tools and modes reflect those patients. Second is about clarity. Uh, even normally, you know, for example, I tell something to my son, often I have to tell it twice. Because you know the young people, even people who are not exactly young also, they will have this earphone into their body, permanently connected to earphones. So everything you say, you will have to repeat, okay? When you, when you talk to people who are far away, when they cannot guess what you're saying through the body language, because often we, we guess the meaning. We may not get the whole of a whole of what a person says. We may get something like 60, 70 percent of what a person says. The rest we kind of guesstimate, you know. The rest we kind of conclude that this is what he or she may have meant. Okay. So now you don't have the person near you. Your, your capacity to guess, to go for an intelligent kind of a guess, uh, is taken away from you. You don't, ha you don't have that capacity, you can't do that. So you need to be very clear. So speak slow to your students. Definitely uh, slow down. Make deliberate efforts to slow down so that uh, they will be able to take the cognitive load of what you are trying to say. They can, they can listen, they can sink in, they can process the information you deliver uh, through your uh, language. The pace of delivery becomes uh, important. Volume uh, is another significant uh, element. Volume is a significant uh, element because uh, often when you talk to them, you know there will be a lot of ambient noises coming from the uh, surrounding. The sound of birds, animals, people uh, talking in the next room, okay, or something happening in the neighborhood. All, all these noises from, from the uh, context will be creeping into what you're saying. So you will have to 
increase the volume of, or, of what you're saying. That is one way of ensuring that what you say is audible to, to everyone listening to you uh, from uh, far away. And if you are providing foundational knowledge often, the pace of explanation becomes important. When you explain something, normally we try to slow down. We try to repeat the explanation uh, too. So your usual pace of delivery should be slow and your pace of uh, explaining what you're saying, the, the speed of narration should be uh, reduced in a, in a big way. That would uh, help them uh, understand properly what you're trying to uh, communicate. And, and the nature of expressions, I'm sorry about the missing F over there, uh, nature of expressions and, and feelings. And when you, you, you know that when you talk over the phone, often people misunderstand you because they cannot see the emotion on your face. They, they, they will just listen to the words you use. And much of the miscommunication sometimes between partners, between pairs, you know, uh, between the husband and the wife, uh, when, you, uh, when you talk over the phone can be because you hear what the person says, but you cannot see the expression on the face of the person uh, over there. So, uh, especially when you use language to criticize, uh, language uh, perhaps to, to uh, correct your students at the other end, be very careful about, about it. Be very careful uh, because uh, they might get your expressions through the audio, they may not be able to see uh, the emotion on your face. So pick your expressions as, as good as you can. And sometimes you can even uh, flip those expressions. Uh, what sounds like negative, probably you can make it sound positive. And that would help you have a better relationship uh, communicatively with your uh, learner. As I said earlier, it's difficult. Your, our houses are not built to be recording stations. They have their limitations. So uh, when, you, when you record from your home, we try to uh, minimize distraction, but still it is possible that some of those noises, the family sounds uh, would, would get in. That will affect what you are saying, and you will have to struggle to explain uh, what you try to communicate with them. So please pay attention to that too. Another uh, significant uh, element is brevity. Now, uh, Kano University communicated that they have taken up with UGC and the resource person talk length has been cut down from three hours to two hours now. So because it is so much of a uh, strain for everyone to keep on watching the screen, listening to it so much. Digital connectivity is all right, but too much of digital connectivity can, can uh, kill curiosity, kill the interest too. So try to be brief, be to the point. When you talk theory, when you, when, you, when you deliver your lessons, the content, uh, try to be as, as brief as possible. Of course, if they are not able to follow what you say, they would come up with a follow-up question later and you will be able to explain. And they would listen to you because you are explaining as a consequence of the question they have uh, raised. So, uh, a, a, a traditional 50 minutes kind of a lecture probably they can, you can compress into like 30, 35 minutes often in smaller chunks. Don't be verbose. What do you mean by verbose? Uh, if you're verbose, you will be using uh, lots of, lots of words, lots of language. 
what could be spoken in probably in five words, you might do that in 50 words, being expansive. So do not go for that. You can reduce what you have to say, reduce it sensibly, meaningfully, so that uh, you don't take too much of time to explain what could be explained in, in a uh, brief period of time. Focus on, uh, on that. Now, uh, Sloan, as I mentioned earlier, I repeat it once again because slowness can always help people understand what you say. And if you're slow, you will be very clear too. It helps clarity. Generally, uh, a, a decent share of recordings I have listened to, recordings of teachers delivering the content in the classroom, uh, it's not slow, it's a bit fast. I would say. It's more on the fast side. I would recommend teachers uh, to slow down so that your audience will be able to take in and process the information you pass to them or try to pass uh, to them. This is more relevant today. As I said earlier, once again, be correct because it's recorded, delivered, it, it, it can have permanence because the recording you send will, will be in the virtual uh, ecosystem for a long, long time. Okay? So make sure that the information you deliver uh, is, 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 is correct. All right? And uh, if, if not, you, you know the challenge is involved at a, at a later uh, stage. So pay a lot of attention to the, the correctness uh, part of uh, what you're trying uh, to do, right? And I mentioned passingly earlier something about uh, politeness. The language you use should be always polite and courteous. At college level, in higher education institutions, you have adults as students. You need to be respectful to them. You need to listen to them. These are core elements of effective communication. And these are not restricted only to online communication. But for the reasons which I have mentioned earlier, it is always advisable that you speak to your students online in courteous uh, fashion. Be respectful uh, to them. So much of the soft skills in terms of talking politely, courteously, right, uh, should be improved. This is a, a significant uh, demand uh, at the moment. Teachers conversational skills, particularly the casual conversational skills may not be very strong often because we lecture. So our transactional language will be strong and, and uh, interactional language may not be very, very strong. But a situation like this forces every one of us to uh, work on it and try to be uh, more polite uh, to them. Things like apologizing or again uh, complimenting, right? Uh, thanking some very fundamental uh, elements of impressive and effective communication uh, should be uh, taken out and applied very generously in the current uh, context. And only if we do that, we would be successful in, as I said, navigating the current crisis and we'll be able to deliver our lessons uh, home. You may have uh, heard about personalization becoming a significant element in education these days. And they say that the kind of, kind of education which is uh, 
evolving and would emerge, step out of the shadows after the pandemic will be so much more personalized than it is today. When, when you have machine learning, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, all these step into the domain of education, there will be so much personalization coming in. One university in Spain, I think, one school in Spain, I think, uh, they used chatbots to take questions from students. And during a period of experimentation, the chatbot accepted around 39,000 questions from the students. And it was able to answer 93 around, I think, 93% uh, of, of uh, questions uh, from the students correctly. They were able to do that. Now, the advantage of the data you receive like that is this. If you get 30, 40,000 days of uh, questions from learners, you can very easily understand the concerns of the learner, the difficulties faced by the learner, and those concerns, difficulties, doubts, and, and, and questions would be very useful for you when you design the learning experience of the learner in the future of each learner you can understand in such a way. Personalization comes in when you talk about each learner. Each learner's questions, each learner's concerns, each learner's difficulties become more relevant. So one size, you know, doesn't fit all. When you teach online increasingly, you should be aware about each and every learner thoroughly right and depending on them you will be uh, able to make adjustments of your uh, lessons or interactions for example in flipped flipped kind of a learning you no know, uh, my college al shifa college is organizing a, a presentation on a flipped classroom on 28th we have around 840 registrations so far Huge number. See, uh, uh, flipped learning uh, tries to tell you that often you should check with your students whether your students are happy with uh, audio mode or video mode kind of thing. And see if you will be able to give a video mode to those who are looking for the video and audio mode to those who are looking for the audio. I know what you're thinking about now you are wondering how challenging this is going to be, how difficult this is going to be for the teacher. Definitely this will be very challenging for the uh, teacher to do, but um, we have lots of teachers like you who are ready to take on the challenge. So know the learner, vary the modes. A choice of tone and words, the way you talk to one student need not be the way you should talk to another student. The language changes, the etiquette can change. Uh, what, do you, what do you say will register in one way with one, one bunch of students and it may not register equally well with uh, another bunch of uh, students, all right? So a choice of tone and words are important. You will have to personalize, as I said, if you're giving a wordcast or a podcast, personalization becomes more important. And this is something you can try to work out uh, in your uh, classrooms now, in your online teaching experiences now. It's, it's quite important. And always try to collect opinion, feedback. Consistent, recurrent, uh, repeated feedback taking is absolutely necessary in online teaching because you don't have them face to face. Because you don't have them face to face, you know, you will have to connect with them every now and then, uh, uh, shooting a question or a comment or asking for consent from different members of the community uh, frequently in the classroom.
And this, this is the personalization challenge you are facing today. And as I remarked earlier, very increased levels of personalization will become a core feature of education, including higher education uh, in the periods to come. So this can be your apprenticeship period when you learn more regarding how to personalize your sessions and how to know your learner one after the other in, in many ways. Demands of different learners will be different and you also will have to be communicatively competent to address the, the demands of different uh, learners. That's about tools. Uh, I can skip that one because you know lots of tools now, right? You can educate me on that rather than me educating you on that, right? See, uh, before I uh, move to the next level, I would say that be prepared with a plan always. Planning is difficult and things may not go as, as we plan. I understand. But I would always suggest that have a plan. What are the modes of communication you would use for this particular lesson, right? And which are the ways in which you'll use, which more, more audio, more video kind of thing. And your preferred options, your preferred options and your students' preferred options about it. And the frequency with which you will be using those uh, tools for uh, communication. Uh, those uh, become very uh, relevant in the current day communication uh, uh, strategy, right? Now, you should also think about, for example, uh, everyone is on Facebook, everyone is on WhatsApp, many are on Telegram, migrating to Telegram also. And sometimes to, to drive home the formal nature of the educational process, you can use email as a serious tool. You can, you can tell them that uh, information regarding uh, lesson plans, information uh, regarding feedback uh, exercises and all, uh, every week I'll be sending to you through mail. That's the plan I spoke about earlier. So use uh, email effectively. Uh, another advantage when you use email effectively is that uh, your students will have a practice of using email. Because they are, they are on to social media in a big way, many of them are not familiar with the etiquettes of, of email. You can, you can use this as an opportunity to uh, uh, develop better practices among them regarding effective use of uh, email. You can also use boards, uh, discussion boards are there, like a jam board in Google Classroom and all, and Zoom also will have devices like that. Try to use discussion boards effectively. Uh, and often, when you throw it up for discussion, uh, uh, they will, they will uh, energize themselves and try to connect uh, uh, to you. It becomes important. Uh, they, can, they can pass a comment, crack a light jock, uh, maybe share an experience we have, uh, narrate an anecdote of one kind or another, disagree with you uh, on certain points you have said. So take up discussion board as an important tool over there. You can make synchronous announcements, so sometimes you do it asynchronously. Try different web tools also. Um, some people you go for blog and certain other things like that. And whenever uh, you conclude a session, uh, you know, is <coughs> sorry about it. Uh, you can conclude with uh, certain remarks over there and uh, you can wish them right towards the end. And uh, wishing statements, I'm sorry, can be added, uh, wish statements, wishing statements uh, can be added towards the end, uh, which perhaps you do not normally do in every, uh, every session of uh, yours. Make it a habit to, to sign off the way you sign off sometimes from a, 
uh, uh, chat with someone. I would, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, community of inquiry uh, here. Now, community of inquiry is a concept which is uh, often uh, used in connection with uh, online uh, teaching. And it is often connected with uh, distant uh, education mode too. In, uh, we know that we are not doing a distant education mode. We are not doing even, in a sense, we are not doing even online teaching. We are doing crisis online teaching. We are doing it as, as a stopgap arrangement, but the problem is it's a long gap. Right? So the whole, one whole semester we have kind of uh, filled the gap with online teaching. We thought COVID would say bye in a, in, a, in a couple of months, but it's still around. It would be still around probably with us. Perhaps the whole of the year we'll have to go with online teaching. So ours is not an online program, but we are doing something uh, more difficult than the actual online uh, program does. They have a plan for that, right? Uh, they are actually prepared for this kind of a uh, delivery of content, but we are not. So community of inquiry is a concept they talk about in online teaching model designed by Gary Zanetos and an author. You can Google and find out. And this is, this is uh, about, it talks about the interplay of three elements uh, teaching presence, social presence, and cognitive uh, presence. Uh, all the three talks about presence. And I talk about it here, I, I, I bring it up here because presence becomes a serious concern in uh, online uh, teaching. The student presence, the teacher presence, the apparent teacher presence, or the actual student presence, uh, the apparent virtual presence and actual virtual absence, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of presences and absences uh, reside uh, in, the, in the concept of uh, online teaching uh, learning practices. So we'll took, we, will, we will take a close, uh, a limited, but yet close look at the three concepts they talk about of teaching presence, cognitive presence, and social uh, presence. That's just a, a diagrammatic uh, representation of COI community of uh, inquiry within inquiry with an eye. Okay, you can see those uh, three circles and you can see those intersections and how the heart of the intersection is marking that educational uh, experience. I'm talking, not talking about supporting discourse or setting climate and selecting the content, but the three presences uh, I'm talking about. Now, consider the first one, teacher presence. One of the customary complaints against online uh, teaching is that the instructor is absent. The teacher is absent. And say that the teacher absence will, will significant, significantly alter the learning experience of the, of the students. And we know that if you're talking about distance education or, or, or online education as such, not our situation, ours is different, as I said, we are forced to switch to our online uh, teaching today. Teacher absence, uh, they say, is a significant uh, gap over there. So how can we address the teacher, uh, the so-called teacher absence? When you talk about teacher presence in online learning, the two primary uh, functions of two, uh, teacher presence. One is about design and the other one is about uh, facilitation. Okay. 
And design element deals with the structure of the lessons you deliver. How have you structured your lesson? How do you start it? Uh, what are the stages your lessons will pass through? And how do you uh, conclude it? Okay. And uh, how have you organized the whole flow of ideas uh, of your class from the beginning through the middle uh, to the very, very end? Design becomes important because if you uh, design it uh, and if you facilitate that design uh, with the right kind of setting, I, I showed that in the diagram, setting, uh, setting climate for the learning through communication prompts, feedback and guidance. As I said, uh, every now and then within, within the design you have created, there must be opportunities for connecting with the learner. And if you have opportunities to connect with the learner, then the teacher presence will always be uh, felt uh, right through. Otherwise, there will be a complete and probably unacceptable, unreasonable disconnect between uh, the instructor and the learner. Because usually you talk about a uh, learner-instructor connection, a learner uh, content connection and learner learner connection. So try to design it in such a way that you have elements of uh, facilitation inbuilt into uh, your uh, lessons with communication prompt, something which can trigger them uh, and trigger their mind something which can kind of hook them and back to bring them back to the thoughts you're trying to develop inside them, that kind of a thing. And it can also be with constant feedback you give with whatever activities you're running in the, in the classroom. The second element is social uh, presence. Social presence uh, it, it talks about the students, it need not be only students, it can also be uh, that of the teacher too. The student's ability to project the personality into, into community. In the sense that a social presence should be felt by the learner. The learner should feel that uh, he or she is a member of a community that there are other members in the same community and that he's being connected to the other members in the community and they are participating in a community uh, experience, right? So it's, 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 it's like they're projecting the personality into the community and there are three aspects uh, to it. One is effective instruction on the part of the teacher. Second is open communication and group uh, connectedness. And this group connectedness can, can often be built through collaborative and uh, individual activities you can provide for the uh, learner. The student activities are, are significant and we should try to integrate more student activities, individual pair or group, whole class kind of work uh, into the learning uh, process. And the third one is a cognitive presence. Here, in cognitive presence, it's, uh, this, this becomes evident when the students try to really participate in the construction of uh, knowledge. Purposefully and, and, and collaboratively they do that. They, they should, uh, online classes and flipped classes require development of metacognitive skills on the part of the learners. They should learn to learn, right? So they should purposefully, because they, learn, they, they have learned to learn, so purposefully they'll be collaborating in processing the information we have given and constructing knowledge. And when they do that, it would result in uh, deep meaning for the activities they are doing and they will be able to retain the knowledge they have gained from the classroom and they could, they could, uh, they could 
definitely be good in critical uh, thinking too as a uh, result of the of the process all right now uh, this is one one web page uh, where probably if you have a real plan you know you can test your online teaching uh, competence and check how good you are for online uh, uh, teaching uh, over there this is actually the 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 first half of my presentation right uh, uh, all of you are around just to check yes, that you, yes uh, okay okay uh, all right uh, uh, all right okay just to wake you up kind of okay uh, all right so uh, uh, I'll take you back to my the second part of my presentation and uh, which talks about face-to-face -face, uh, communication the real classroom in the, in the now we have to talk about traditional classroom because uh, we are in the middle of the so-called uh, online teaching see uh, I will not be uh, uh, using a, a lot of uh, slides are over here when I talk about uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, teaching my, my intention is is to brush up certain things you know you, you're all experienced people I'm sure regarding uh, what normally should happen in an effective uh, classroom communication uh, scenario as I tried to uh, show you over here, usually the first part I always talk about the person who is doing the act of communication. In my experience, much of the difficulty of, of uh, communication in the classroom uh, stems from the confidence levels of the communicator. The confidence level of the of the teacher uh, I would say if the confidence level of the teacher uh, is low there's there's always the possibility that the, the process of communication uh, will be seriously uh, affected and the result would be compromised so I would recommend uh, high levels of confidence on the part of the uh, teacher when the teacher uh, walks into the classroom and your your confidence will be reflected in the way you step uh, into uh, the, the, the classroom uh, the way you move around uh, in the classroom the way you walk actually as I normally say, like uh, chin up, chest out uh, kind of a walk that you are capable of. You are not pretending that you know everything about your topic, but you are confident about uh, at least what you know and what you don't know. You know the sphere to which you belong and you, you are ready to uh, deliver that. You know your, your competence has got its limits, but that doesn't upset your level of confidence. And this is, this is actually the, the sense of confidence that, that will help you in delivering the, con the content uh, in, the, in the classroom. This is significant. Uh, and you need to take that uh, seriously. And some physical elements always play an important role uh, in that. In the sense that uh, a, a, an expression I have, I have often used, I've borrowed it from somewhere, is, is about the image deficit some people uh, suffer from. Image deficit in the sense that uh, we think uh, we should be like this, but we are like this. And there is a gap between uh, what we think we should be and what we know we are. 
So between the real and the supposed, there's a kind of a or kind of a huge gap, or at least we feel that there is a gap, and we uh, uh, struggle in the process. The sense of uh, insufficiency, the sense of self-created insufficiency, you are the one who feels like that. That can upset the communication uh, process, fundamentally. This is why I say that uh, you need to believe in yourself, you need to make yourself competent, and uh, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't really uh, upset you. Your limitations should not upset what you do. This uh, should be one of the priorities. You are who you are, right? Uh, I can't be you, you can't be me, and I cannot be somebody else. So we know who we are and uh, uh, try, to, try to know who you are and try to build uh, on that. And if you think that there are areas to improve, you need to work on it and improve. Work very hard and improve. This is, this is a very important thing. People always feel that uh, it's a lack of language skills, it's a lack of fluency that creates a lot of problems. I have felt that, that that sense of insufficiency which is eating you from inside, that could be the prime villain when you perform in a classroom. Every classroom act is, is, is a solid piece of performance. So I'm sure uh, you would uh, try to invest a lot of effort in being sure about uh, who you are. As I tell all, all, all my uh, teacher trainees in sessions often, uh, every, every week, 15, 16 hours, well, that's what the UGC is, isn't it? 16 hours minimally, uh, a group of people will be watching you, observing you, and you perform in front of them. All the performances should definitely help you strengthen and build the skills of presentation, theatrical movements inside the classroom, and be bold about who you are, not being apologetic about how you look and how you move around. This becomes very, very important uh, when, when you talk about uh, communication. I often tell my uh, faculty members that we shouldn't be driven by what upsets you. We should be driven by what you do not have. You should be uh, driven by what you would like to have drive for those, those gaps uh, in, your, in your persona, if you think there are some. That's where I, I'm sure you all will be uh, investing and working uh, very, very hard on uh, in the future. There are lots of challenges thrown in. And when you talk about communication, COVID period has exposed the communicative uh, weaknesses, soft spots of millions of teachers around. You know, there are thousands of uh, institutions, whether schools or colleges, in which they have uh, kept their faculties hidden without exposing them because they are scared of exposing them. They don't, fa they don't have faith in the communicative competence of them in the language skills, uh, probably in the grammar or, or in the pronunciation or whatever. They're scared of making them talk in front of the students and of course students' uh, parents and the public watching the teacher shows uh, these uh, days. Which means that you need to seriously uh, invest in terms of the uh, language skills uh, you possess. Otherwise, uh, your career is going to be <laughs> in trouble uh, in, the, in the future, right? And with that indication, I'm shifting from the person to the, the language part. Part of what I have said so far uh, already is related to the language part. 
I have felt that when, when I listen to recordings of classes, I, I, listen, I try to listen to recordings of classes, I kind of push my friends and colleagues to send me recordings. Uh, um, they will be a bit, bit, bit doubtful about it, but they do send to you uh, that kind of uh, stuff. Uh, so they send uh, recordings and I often find uh, problems with number one, the prime problem I find, the area in which you have to improve is, as I said earlier, the interactive part. As I say, you can deliver a lecture. This is possible. You can deliver a lecture and uh, they would listen to a lecture as a lecture. But often that, that communicative prompt which will link you to the audience may lie in a comment you make or a question you ask, right? Or a light-hearted statement you make about somebody somewhere. These are the small uh, hooks you build into your lecture and presentation with which you bring people in. Or you keep those people with you if you have already brought them in. And this needs to happen repeatedly in your session. And I would say that the soft skills of the teachers would, would, would improve in terms of conversational ease, you know. You need to have more conversation in the classroom, more dialogue, less monologue in the classroom. And when it becomes necessary that you should go for more, more conversation in the classroom, more uh, uh, dialogue in the classroom, you realize that it's a bit uh, challenging for us. So try to improve on conversational skills, especially uh, casual conversation or skills. Chatting up with your learners. That is necessary. And your students also require those skills. And where will they get those skills from, if not from you? Try to, try to work on that. And when you talk about uh, the lecture part of the lecture part of the language, I often feel uh, that the areas in which you can, you can, people can try to improve is number one, the beginning uh, of that uh, lecture, the beginning part of it. Uh, how do you start? When you ask for recordings <laughs> from teachers sometimes, you know, uh, most of the classes, uh, I don't want to talk about the percentage, but what is that one fine way of everybody beginning their classes? Uh, good morning. So today we'll, we'll talk about, to, or today we'll discuss about, discuss about, whatever. Okay, leave the language part. Now this is, this is one of those conventional openings you get. Good morning students, so today we'll talk about. Uh, good morning students, today we'll discuss about. And when I, when I sit on an interview board, when we watch uh, mock classes being taken by teacher candidates on an interview board, the moment you get that line, you know something is turned off. You don't feel like uh, listening to the rest of it. Because that line can completely turn you off. Today I'm going to, today we are going to discuss about, finished. That's, that, that, that's a kind of switch which, which might turn your students off to. Go for novel, new, different. Think out of the box, or as somebody put it in the book title, uh, thank you for being late. <laughs> Think without the box. Go for novel variations and rhythms in the classroom. Opening moves should be good, should be catching them. Okay, so try to work on the opening part of the language uh, thing. And the other element in the, in the, in the language part is, uh, <coughs> is, is related to the simplicity of the words you use and the shortness of the sentences you construct. 
Use simple language so that people can follow what you say. And construct short sentences. Being short and simple is very effective. It can connect you well to your uh, learner. You should make it a practice because uh, the, the, the ultimate goal of what you're doing in a classroom is to make them understand something. Communication is actually a strategy. A strategy to get a desired outcome, a desired result. And communication is an act of manipulation. You manipulate the resources inside you. You manipulate the, the interest, emotions of the learner in such a way that you get the intended uh, result. This is what uh, uh, communication uh, uh, is all about. And if you're not good at those manipulation in the classroom, you will definitely uh, have a feeling that uh, you don't deliver what you are uh, expected to uh, deliver. So uh, try to uh, uh, find ways of uh, uh, doing that, manipulating those simple and short. The other uh, uh, concern sometimes is related to the pace, as I said. The speed with which you speak uh, should be in accordance with the speed with which your students can process the information you try to deliver uh, to them. Some of us are too fast and some perhaps is a bit slow. We need to find uh, a way I meet your kind of a position in which you don't speak too slow, you don't speak too fast. You can speak at a pace which is good for them and sometimes slightly challenging for them also. Because when you are slightly challenging for them, uh, it, it improves their uh, competence in the use of language. They, their, their comprehension speed also can uh, improve in the, in the process. We need to pay uh, attention to that too, uh, occasionally. When I, when, I, when I said you should use simple words uh, in one orientation program in one university, uh, one, one participant asked me, sir, if you always use simple words, where will they get some difficult words from? So uh, it's advisable that you occasionally mix a difficult word with a simple word. I said, fine, we can do that. That is a good idea. So you can occasionally uh, mix a hard word with a simple one that, may, that might make the students curious and they would look up for that word in the dictionary and try to find the uh, meaning uh, of uh, that. Another uh, uh, input I would like to give you in terms of language is some of those uh, uh, features of language, which are paralinguistic features kind of thing. You talk about sometimes uh, <clears throat> the, the pronunciation part, the accent part kind of uh, thing. See, uh, very rarely your students complain about the pronunciation of a teacher. Uh, they might do so if the pronunciation uh, makes it difficult for them to understand the whole uh, session. It makes it difficult for them to follow what you say. So do not, do not pay uh, unnecessary importance to that. Uh, Pronunciation is actually there for a reason, and you know what the reason is. Yeah, so that uh, everybody would, would, would utter, speak in the same manner, in the sense that each letter will be pronounced similar way, so that it is easy, easy for people to understand each other. Mutual uh, comprehension becomes uh, easier in that fashion. Pronunciation is, 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 not, is not a fad, it's not a trend kind of thing. It makes language easier to, to comprehend. 
same is the case of something like uh, uh, what is it stress or intonation accent and all you have all kinds of accents these days Indian American Australian Canadian native blah blah you have so uh, don't worry too much don't lose your sleep over uh, what you consider to be your bad uh, accent uh, speak the way you can don't don't give a lot of importance don't give a lot of importance to the stress element make it comprehensible understandable to your uh, learner when you uh, speak uh, to them this is some observation I make the rest I think uh, we can pick it up when 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 the uh, interaction part comes in another uh, significant uh, element I would like you to uh, focus on is uh, related to certain uh, it's sometimes related to the accent part sometimes related to the practice part for instance uh, uh, these days if you ask a question uh, to a candidate in an interview like where are you from uh, and the candidate would respond uh, where am I from? Uh, I'm from Cochin. Uh, uh, have you have you have you read the uh, recent nonfiction work by Arundhati Roy? Uh, recent nonfiction work by Arundhati Roy? Um, no, no, I haven't read uh, that. So this eco eco phenomenon is a very common thing. They do not know, the candidates do not know how to take a question properly, follow that question, or respond to that in the proper way. Now, where are you from? Oh, you can at least you can say, oh, me, uh, I'm from Cochin. Or you can simply say, oh, I'm from Cochin. I come from Cochin. I come from Bangalore, enough. Uh, so your, your, your father is working in Bangalore. Uh, maybe they'll say, uh, my father is working in Bangalore. I, my father is working in Bangalore. Uh, the kind of processing of the information you do inside your brain, you know, it, 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 it kind of comes out in the form of a language. Right? And it, it creates a jarring, jarring uh, feeling for the, for the listener. This is some practice, <coughs> I'm sorry, you have to um, uh, avoid in your conversation. Another I have felt is in the tone part of it. For example, uh, when, when a Malayalam uh, a Keralaite is speaking English, Keralaite will speak English with a Malayalam tone, a Malayalam rhythm. Uh, like a tongue, someone from Trichur, uh, Trichur is a district in Kerala, so someone from uh, Trichur uh, will be using the Malayalam kind of a uh, tone. The Trichur dialect tone will be put into the uh, English spoken by someone from Trichur. Uh, it, 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 it creates sometimes a kind of a funny feeling. Uh, you, can, you can try to uh, neutralize it when it comes to uh, that kind of a uh, uh, practice. Language uh, for a classroom should be, as I say, uh, rich in, in functional competence. I have always recommended that the English for teachers should, all, should necessarily contain uh, enough elements of language functions. For example, like even simple people might think that this is think that this is very insignificant and uh, silly sort of simple things like how to ask for permission, how to give grant permission, how to apologize, how to compliment, how to sympathize, how to advise. These kinds of functional competence should be there on the part of the teachers too. This is what I mentioned earlier. For instance, if you have more interaction and if you run more activities uh, in the classroom, then uh, definitely you require uh, that kind of a competence in language. But if you don't uh, run activities in the classroom, then you don't need that. 
if somebody is doing your work, you know, even an assignment, you're checking the assignment and say that, oh, your, your, your beginning is very good, Rita. Excellent. Congratulations, you started very well. You're complimenting, right? But then you would like to give a suggestion also. Then you give a suggestion. But you should, you should give the suggestion in a polite way, in a very courteous manner. Now, you say that if I were you, if I were you, uh, if, if I, I were the one doing the assignment, if I were you, I would have started like this. And all these, all these uh, interactions inside the, the classroom can help them a lot. And that can improve the, the, the functional uh, competence, competence of language functions, English language functions, or it can be in any language, okay, competence of these. It becomes uh, necessary for uh, every, every one of them. This is why uh, uh, when you talk about classroom communication, you talk about the language part of it, you talk about the person part of it, and the, the last element I had mentioned on the slide was the audience part of it. You know the youngsters you handle today, the millennials, all right? They are a bit restless kind of a generation. Disrupted generation and disruption is part of their life, uh, always. They want quick results, right? They would like to skip the process and come to the product. Skip the process and come to the uh, result kind of thing. They are a bit, bit restless. They are hands-on people. They are, as you know, completely wired into the um, uh, digital, uh, endless di digital possibilities. You should check the features of the millennials, the communicative features of the millennial students, and try to add those into your classroom communication practices. That is why I said that if they look for shorter stretches of communication, if they are looking for uh, means of interaction every now and then, possibilities of interaction, and if you would like to chat up, if they would like to chat up with you, then you should know how to chat up with them too. So this is where once again the casual communication uh, skills uh, become uh, important in one way or uh, another. And I would like uh, uh, teachers to build the competence on those communication skills because those are more required by your students, enjoyed by your students, and through those uh, channels of communication, you will be capable of building your relationship with your uh, learner. That is, that's quite important. Maybe it's because of all the chatting they have done, the social media influence. They are for a briefer kind of thing. Quick. Have you watched them watch uh, videos and all? Yeah, when they watch videos, I've seen my, my, my daughter watch videos. Uh, even if it's a three minute kind of a video, you know, uh, they'll watch at the beginning, then, then push to the next one, then, then push, drag, 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 finished. So they will, they will pause at significant places and just have a look and finished. They, they may not enjoy slowly going through the whole thing uh, uh, often. If this is the way they are, because you, our intention is to join them where they are and to connect with them. And then the language which they prefer, the language which we, with which we can connect to them becomes important for us when we use language in our classrooms because they are the targets uh, of our uh, classrooms. And if we don't do that, there could be a problem. That's why we begin to enjoy all those terms like if they use bro, you will use bro, okay? Or all kinds of uh, uh, abbreviations and acronyms which they, they use, we try to understand that. And sometimes it's, uh, it's nice to connect with them with those uh, expressions. Now, uh, I said audience because uh, you don't have to worry about who you are. Okay, you need to think about 
you need to worry also about who your learners are. If you cannot tune yourself to their needs, their modes and manners, often we lose them. And when you lose them, you will not be able to uh, provide the learning experience uh, you would like to provide uh, for them. This uh, is uh, the trouble. That's why I say that uh, try, to, try to listen to the chat of the youngsters. That will give you a lot of tips about what do they speak about and how, do, uh, how they speak about it, right? And that becomes uh, significant in the classroom. Your concern, I can understand, will be that can the classroom can turn into a chat room? My reply is that occasionally it can. And some of those tools can be uh, used for those purposes uh, too. All right? And uh, I do not know whether I have gone the way you wanted me to go. Uh, I think I was told that there will be a two hour session. Was there a break after the one hour, first one hour? Uh, I'm awfully sorry that I have missed it. No, no problem, sir. It was <laughs> okay. really interesting to listen to you. Normally, we have one hour, but uh, as uh, uh, you were willing to that and we really enjoyed it, we did not disturb you. Okay. Probably we can take a break now for 10 minutes. Yeah, all right. We'll take a break now for 10 minutes and then we can come back for the interaction part. Okay? So, what time do you come back? In 10 minutes means by 3.30, 3 you will be back. Yes, sir. That, that yeah. would be fine. Yeah, all right. Thank you. What is your brand name? Sangar Bhiyo. No. How is Sharp on the record? Thought again. We are going to see you on the desk. No comment. Did you hear your corporate? Did you screen? Did you allow me to go? Saya dah nampak ni middle la, 